of Corrections and Rehabilitation at San Quentin State Prison. This podcast contains language that may not be appropriate for all listeners. Listener discretion is advised. The thing that sticks to mind the most that um, still makes me laugh when I think about it, and this is dark because, I mean, people who don't work in prison may not find this funny, but one of the serial killers over there was very notorious and killed a lot of people. And he goes to my services, and one day I was just walking away from his cell. We were talking, and he said, uh, well, see you later, Father. Don't do anything I wouldn't do. And I thought to myself, well, you really set the bar pretty low for me, didn't you? <laughs> You're now tuned in to San Quentin's Ear Hustle from PRX's Radiotopia. I'm Erlon Woods. I'm incarcerated here at San Quentin State Prison in California. I'm Nigel Poor, a visual artist who volunteers at the prison. And together, we're going to take you inside. This time, we're taking you into a prison within the prison. I come here to San Quentin almost every day, and I always walk the same path. Once I get through the inner checkpoint, I step into the garden chapel area, and it's weird to say, but it's actually kind of lovely. That's cool, that's cool. It's nice because, you know, I always see the same guys tending the rose bushes and the other kind of cheerful plantings that are in there. And on the right is the chapel. Right. In front of me is the hospital. Right. And to the left is this building with really large kind of Gothic writing that says Adjustment Center. The AC. That's what we call it. The adjustment center is where guys go when they're being received to death row. And it's also kind of like the hole. The hole? Administrative segregation is where they isolate you. Oh, oh Where you okay. won't have no contact with nobody. Okay, like the shoe kind of. Pretty much. Okay. And behind and above the adjustment center is death row. And Erlon, I don't know much about it. I just know it's there. And it's kind of weird. It's not something that I really ever hear guys on the main line talk about. Right. Guys like me on the main line... We don't ever have any real contact with guys on death row. Yeah, you know, and the only time I see the guys on death row is when they're being escorted somewhere. And I know it's them because, I, I mean, I say it's shackles, but they have like... Oh, they have these waist chains. Waist chains or around Or they can cuff behind their back. Yeah, and they walk kind of slowly. And I just don't know where I'm supposed to look. Right. For us, if we see them, we're not supposed to look. We're supposed to stop and turn around. Ooh, but do you, do you actually do that? I'm a looker. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to look. I feel the same way. Um, but the way they have it set up, it's like there's this incredible disconnect between the two populations that occupy this prison. Right. You know, it's like for the guys on the main line, and really for me too, death row is like a mystery. It really is. Uh, what do you think when you see a guy being escorted on death row? I think that's fucked up. That's what I think. You know, but I have to thank God that um, they're not escorting me, and I'm not the one on death row. Yeah, I also think how crazy it is how, like, regular they look, you know? It just kind of reminds me of this thing I see in prison. It's like I'm seeing my, I find myself surrounded by a bunch of regular people, but the narratives don't really reflect that. Do you have any thoughts on death row? Not really, you know? I'm not, not one way or the other, you know what I mean? Lonely. Very lonely. Oh, man. We're, as humans, man, we, we adapt to wherever we're at. You know what I'm saying? I don't know. I've never really thought about them people up there because, you know, we all have to carry our own hammers or our, bury our own crosses, however you look at it. It's bad. I mean, waking up knowing you're going to die. If you have to live <laughs> the rest of your life in prison, that would be the spot. Yeah. Because they're not killing nobody on death row. And then out on the on, on line, you have to deal with thousands and thousands and thousands of personalities that clash. You know, at least up there, you know, you get solitude because you're single-celled. Okay, Erlon, that is the last thing I expected to hear about death row. Yeah, that's too much solitude. Yeah, I mean, to say in some ways they have it better than the main line? Yeah, I don't know about that one. But... Like he said, they haven't been killing people up there. Yeah, but my God. The last execution was 2006. Okay, that's true. But in 2016, there were actually two death penalty propositions on the California ballot. Right. And one was to abolish it. Mm -hmm. And the other was to speed up the appeals process so the executions would actually happen faster. And California voted to speed up the process. Yep, that's right. And nobody knows how that's going to play out. 
But in the meantime, we do know there's about 700 guys up there in a building that's not too far from where we're sitting right now. And they're all there waiting in limbo for the state to decide when the next execution is going to take place. Yeah, it's a trip because San Quentin is the only facility in California where executions happen. And if you've been here on this main line for a long time, you remember what it's like. I believe it was in February of 99, a guy by the name of Jantron Sirapong, he was a foreign national, was executed, I believe, for a robbery murder in Southern California. This is Kevin Sawyer. He's been incarcerated for about 20 years. So the prison placed us on lockdown uh, a few hours before the execution. But toward the end of the evening, someone yelled out, do you think we should have a moment of silence for the guy that's about to get executed? And somebody responded with, F him. He shouldn't have did what he did. I was kind of uh, outraged because that could have been anybody in prison who has a case of, say, manslaughter to first-degree murder. Okay, Kevin makes a really good point. Some of the guys are here on the main line for committing the same types of crimes that put other guys on death row. Yeah, a lot of it depends on how the police report got written, how a prosecutor moves forward, or how a jury rules. Right. It's not like everybody up there is a serial killer. It's true they've all been convicted of murder, Mm -hmm. but so have a lot of people down here on the main line. That's right. And we've been able to interview a number of those guys, but we're not allowed to have contact with the death row inmates. We can't invite them down to the media lab, and we're not allowed to visit them up there. But like a lot of things in prison, there's always a workaround, and we tried to find one. Yes. The first thing we did was we talked to a few people who do spend time on death row. Well, the first visual is the big iron door that says condemned row. And it looks like it was... That's Rabbi Paul Schleffer. He works for the prison. And he visits death row on a weekly basis. And, you know, you ring the bell and and the guard comes and kind of looks and asks for your ID. And um, it's old. It just looks old. It feels old. It feels like it's been that way for forever. There's five tiers, five stories, right? And, and you know, it's, it's basically 100 cells long. And, you know, people are just having conversations, sort of weaving in between and over each other and up and down and sideways. And, and it's loud. It's crazy. It's chaos. It's like walking into a, a giant hold of a ship Imagine a giant five-story tall Costco, only with nothing to buy. We also spoke with Father George Williams, a Jesuit priest who's part of the prison ministry. It's just sort of metal, um, black metal cell doors and uh, gray concrete walls and really dirty windows. So the, the light is uh, it's kind of dim, uh, even in the daytime. It's, it's, it's just a kind of a dark place. Um, and there's not a lot of color in it. I mean, it's just, aside from black and gray, there's nothing growing in there. There's no, you don't get a sense of there being life. Of course, it's death row, I suppose. Why would you? It's almost as though someone went in there and, and took the color out of it. You know, it's like sucked the life out of the place. For those of you who've listened before, you know that we're not in this media center alone. We have the San Quentin newspaper right next door. The paper's actually written and published inside the prison, but printed on the outside. So when it's getting ready to be delivered, a truck brings all the issues down to the media lab. The newspaper ships out to all the prisons in California, including San Quentin. And that means for us, luckily, it also goes to death row. Okay, so we're, we're, we're putting these letters inside the San Quentin newspaper. So basically, we threw a line out to see if anyone would bite, and it came in the form of a letter. To whom it may concern, my name is Nigel Poor, and I'm one member of the team that produces the podcast Ear Hustle from within inside San Quentin State Prison. 
You may have heard our podcast as it airs on Channel 19 on the prison closed circuit station. The purpose of the podcast is to debunk some of the stereotypes and assumptions that people hold about those who are incarcerated. We are contacting you because we want to include the entire San Quentin community. And although death row is isolated from the rest of the prison, it is still part of the community. To be clear, we do not do stories about anyone's particular case or crime. We do not do stories that talk about how unfair the system is. We do stories about the everyday experience that show life inside in a realistic and three-dimensional way. Erlon, I don't know about you, but I had no idea how I was going to react to these letters. What do you mean? Well, I spend a lot of time on the main line here, and I'm totally comfortable. Right. But most of what I know about death row comes from the movies, and they may not be realistic, but the movies have a way of filling your imagination with really frightful thoughts. And on top of that, there are people up there who have done really awful things. Yeah, you, 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 things. you have people that's up there that have done things to the extreme. Mm-hmm. And that's why they're up there. Yeah. But every day, both you and I interact with guys who are in for murder, and we don't even think about it. No, it's true. I totally understand that. And I'm not saying that my reaction was the right reaction. I'm just saying that it was there, and it was difficult, and it was something I really had to work through. Plus, I also have to admit I had concerns about offending the families of their victims. That's understandable. Yeah, so it was really helpful to hear what Father George had to say about this. When I first got there, I started, I was curious, so I would read the files of like what people were in for, and that's what gave me nightmares. I stopped reading because they were, some of the crimes there were pretty horrible. But when I'm with the guys there, I don't think about their crime because they're not their crime. They're, it's the man in front of me, and whatever he did, that's something that he did in the past, and it's not my job. He's already been judged, so I don't need to be doing that. I think it's, in some ways, the darkest place in California because it's where we've put the people that people fear the most and just have so much hatred and anger toward, and we've thrown them away in this building. And there's no hope. I mean, at least the thing about San Quentin that's different from a lot of places is there are programs, there's hope, guys have an incentive, and we believe that people can change. I mean, most of us who work here do believe that. There, it's like, they're not allowed to change. They're, they are stuck in being the worst thing they ever did. And the best thing they could hope for would be life without parole, which I think is even worse than the death penalty. The worst thing about death row is just the fact that it exists. Let's open them. Right in here. We didn't get a lot of letters back from death row in response, but we got a few. And we thought maybe we'd get a correspondence going and then get guys down here on the main line to read the letters, and we would record that. Like Ken Burns, <laughs> we put some soulful fiddle music behind it. But a few of the guys who responded to our letter agreed to call us and let us record them, which is allowed under California law. We can't interview them in person, and we can't request to interview a specific inmate. But they can call us if they want to. So, at the appointed hour, we brought our recording equipment into the tiny office of Larry Schneider. He runs the media lab for the prison. Um, this is Larry Schneider. I'm going to open it up to speakerphone so you can speak with Nigel Poor and Erlon Woods, who are the uh, air hustle folks. Hello. All right, hey, hold on one second. Let's get to make sure these volumes are, are, are together. The first man we spoke to was Steve Champion. He was 18 when he was first incarcerated, and he came to San Quentin when he was 20. He's been here on death row for 36 years. Could you um, could you describe your cell to us? Well, let me let me say this. It's not that big. You have a stainless steel toilet and a sink. You have uh, two lockers that's uh, attached to the wall. You have a bunk. For me, I don't sleep on the uh, steel slab where you place the mattress at. But what I have did for the last 30 years is that I sleep on the floor. And I use my bunk, the slab, as my desk. Yeah, my name is Joseph uh, Manuel Montes. I was uh, 20 years old uh, when I caught this case in 94. And I've been uh, on death row uh, ever since. 
We asked Joseph about his cell, too. You know, I have a, a, a TV. You know, I have a, you know, a CD player. I have a, a typewriter. You know, I usually use my bed as a desk. You know, my, all my family pictures up. Uh, I call it the Wall of Fame. Um, I have a map uh, on my wall. You know, I like looking at certain continents, you know, certain places in the world when I'm looking at a PBS program. Do you enjoy not having a cellmate? <laughs> you know, hearing your episode on having cellmates, uh, yes, I like it the way it is right now. <laughs> so it sounds like all the cells on Condemned Row are pretty much the same as the cells on the main line, but they don't have cellies. And almost everyone on the main line has a celly. But you guys get to walk around outside pretty much all day. Yeah, I can be out myself from 6 in the morning to 9 at night. And we can do all kinds of stuff on the main line, like participate in programs, go jogging on the yard, chop it up with the homies. But on death row, there are some serious restrictions. But that depends on which block you're in. We said that death row is a prison within a prison, but it turns out that that inner prison is also divided. You have East Block where guys are in their cells for 20 hours a day, and whenever they come out and go to the yard, for example, they got to be shackled and escorted. But if you go without write-ups for, let's say, several years, and if there's room, you might get to go to North Seg, mm -hmm. which is the block where Joseph's housed. You know, the only time that you have cuffs is when you leave the unit, when you go to a medical escort or you go to, a, uh, to visit. When you go to the yard, you're, you're not handcuffed. You know, you, you just basically go to the back of the unit uh, because the officer, you know, he's able to open up the yard uh, uh, manually. And all we do is basically just walk uh, straight up to the yard. Wait, so guys just walk around freely and do... Yeah, they, they, can, they can walk around freely. They can, uh, um, you know, play uh, card games, uh, use the phone or stay in their cells, or uh, walk up and down the tier as a means to exercise. So when you say yard, do you actually go outside? Yeah. Yeah, I go outside uh, on the roof. On the roof. Oh, okay. On the roof. So that means that you can look over the whole bay? No. No, we're not. We're not. No, everything is, uh, they, they, they covered everything. Uh, our, our view is very limited. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they, cha they, they changed that a long time ago. I mean, when I first got up here, you know, we didn't have a, a covering, so I was able to get a good look, you know, at the ocean and the Richmond Bridge, but they changed that. So what do you see when you look out? Probably the sky now. Yeah, the sky. <laughs> Birds flying, uh, flying above us. Oh, I guess you need to explain this to me better, because I just assume that you have to sit in your cell all day. So tell me what your typical day is like. Uh, everything begins at 730 for everybody, uh, and it ends at 1.30. But basically what I do is, because I'm a yard worker, I, I, I go out to the yard and I, and I clean up, but they let the workers out earlier so we can you know, pass the milk out, pass the lunches out, clean the tables, uh, get the uh, shower buckets ready. We clean the phones down, we wipe the tables down. We just make sure everything is uh, clean for everybody uh, so when they get started with their day, uh, they don't have to deal with the messy tear. Smells. Do you remember any smells? Smells. Well, sure. <laughs> every, every kind of smell. You have the, the smells of, of the bathroom. You name it. It's like a locker room. It's like a bathroom. It's like a cafeteria. And you have the smells of people cooking. You know, meals, people cooking in their hot pots. And, you know, and they figure out ways to uh, cook for each other and, you know, share with each other. Definitely a, an attack on the senses in some ways. You walk by the shower, get the shower smell. You know, it's just the kind of the, the smells of, of daily life, but kind of concentrated. Uh, my name is Daniel Wozniak uh, from Orange County. I've been here in uh, San Quentin a very short time, about uh, just under two years. I got arrested when I was 26 and uh, got convicted and been here since. Daniel was the third and final death row inmate we were able to speak with. He's housed in East Block, where, like we said, they're confined to their cells 20 hours a day. We asked him and Joseph what it's like to spend that much time in a place with so little natural light. Well, each cell has uh, two, two different lights. There's one on the top, one on the bottom that can illuminate the cell. Uh, there's a high setting and a low setting. 
Uh, typically, I leave my lights on all the time just to, you know, create a little bit of brightness. Your sight gets taken away somewhat, and when you uh, enter into a place like this, into prison, you're, you know, you, you have to make a lot of adjustments because you're, you're limited to what you're able to see. So that definitely gets weakened, uh, and what gets strengthened is your uh, sense of hearing. Um, you know, I've, I've learned, you know, and, and I wasn't doing it purposely, but, you know, it just happens naturally, but I've, I've learned how to, how to uh, train my ears to just identify all the different sounds that happen outside of my cell. I mean, I've gotten so good with my sense of hearing, I can actually, you know, tell when, you know, when certain officers are walking down the tier, you know, just by the, the, uh, the jingling of the keys. About a year ago, Joseph had to leave the prison for a medical appointment. It was his first time away from death row in 20 years. After a long time in prison, a medical appointment on the outside can be like a holiday. It's something you look forward to and think back on after it's over. I remember looking at some of the houses uh, that we were driving by, and again, you know, it's been so long since I've seen a house that close. Uh, they didn't look real to me. You know, it, it, my perception of, 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 of size was just way off. And then, you know, when we arrived to the clinic, you know, I was able to smell uh, roses for the first time. And when I smelled those roses and when I smelled those trees, it, it took everything in me, you know, not to break down. And it just seemed like, you know, all my senses, you know, just became alive. You know, you, when you do, uh, you know, so many years in prison, you, you, you get used to this. All we see is green, blue, gray, black. You know, we don't we don't get to see uh, much color at all, other than you know what we see on the on the television. But it's nothing like you know experience it you know personally, and you kind of forget you know how the free world smells like the smell of gas you know coming from uh, the cars or you know just the just the I mean it's freedom you know that's that's the word that I always use when I'm talking to my mom about you know that experience you know I, I smell freedom. You know, the mantle of death is there. There's nothing you can do to escape that. In our conversation with Joseph, Daniel, and Steve, it took a while, but we eventually got around to what it's like living as a condemned man. This is Steve again. Well, you don't wake up consciously thinking about, okay, I'm going to be executed. It's easy to be melancholy in a place like this. You know, that's, that's easy to that. that. That's not hard to do. You know, my sentence was sentenced to death. I wasn't sentenced to be reformed. So any acts of redemption or self-transformation that anybody make on death row, it has to come from themselves. Who am I? Why did I come here? And what is my purpose? And so if you can find out what your central purpose is in life, then that not only becomes your uh, anchor, but that becomes your arm clock that inspires you each and every day to get up and want to do something to pursue that mission. This is Daniel again. There are some guys I know in here who basically they just wake up each morning, turn on the TV, zone out, and go to sleep, and that's their entire life and existence. You can't help but feel sorry for them, and I guess they give me the motivation to not ever want to get there. So I make it a point to just always stay busy. When you study the the great spiritual literature and you study the great spiritual teachers from Akhenaten, from Moses, from Buddha, from Jesus, from the prophet Muhammad, from Gandhi. If you look at each and every one of their lives, they always left the masses of their people and they went off into the wilderness. And that is where they had their quiet time. That is where they meditated at. And so for me, that becomes my force, you know, early in the morning, you know, 3 o'clock and 4 o'clock in the morning, where most of the people are asleep where I can just really have that quiet time to myself and spend about a half an hour just doing that meditation. And then that sets the tone for me for the rest of the day. It starts in the morning. Yeah, it's the most important decision each and every single one of us make that we take for granted. You choose to wake up happy or choose to wake up sad, make that decision. Hopefully it's happy. And then from that point on, you know, I just continue trying to figure it out why am I still alive? Why am I still breathing? Why do I still exist? And I think it's not a matter of knowing what that purpose is. It's about the journey and the discovery and understanding what that is. 
and it constantly changes. I know that my situation is um, dire. I mean, after all, I am on death row. But I can also look out into the outside world, and I can also look at and look out into history. I simply say to myself, if my ancestors can come over here, packed in boats like sardines, come into a world that they had no idea on, and if they can come here with everything in terms of their language, their history, and their culture and customs destroyed and still make something out of nothing, then I don't have anything to complain about. I think the thing that really I notice the most is how firmly guys will grasp my hand in a handshake. It's like they're really reaching out to, to connect with the outside world um, because there's so little touch uh, that goes on in prison in, the, in death row. They're, they're not allowed to really be around other people in, in a way that we would consider human. I once came to a cell of an individual he had a broken tooth, and he was he had a black eye, and he was he was beat up, right? And I said, "What happened?" And he, he said, "Well, I had a cell extraction, right, where they come in and drag them out, right?" And I said, "Why did you do that?" And he said, "I just needed to feel human contact." <laughs> Okay, e, there's something that occurs to me listening to Rabbi Paul and Father George talk about what life is like on death row. What's that? Well, I'm not going to say that it contradicts what the guys themselves are saying, mm -hmm. but there is this kind of disconnect. Well, they don't live up there. That's true, but that's not exactly what I'm getting at. Well, lay it on me. Okay, Rabbi Paul and Father George are so full of empathy, right? Okay. But what strikes me is that at least the guys we talk to don't seem to need empathy or sympathy, huh. they have some kind of curious control over their lives that really surprised me. And it's, a, it's kind of hard to articulate exactly what I mean, but what I walk away with is thinking, these guys are incredibly self-sufficient. Yeah. You know, maybe they aren't, maybe that's what they showed us, but that's what really comes across. Yeah, but remember, this is a select few. I mean, we sent 700 letters up there and only right. got a handful of back. Yeah, yeah. And the guys we ended up talking to, they're determined. They're disciplined. I mean, look at Steve. He has written three entire books in the decades he's been on death row. That's true. And I remember he said sometimes when he has the time to go to the yard, mm -hmm. he actually chooses to stay in his cell and write. Well, he's focused. He's been up in that cell 36 years. Oh, it's so hard to get my mind around that. But I also want to remember that there's a lot of guys up there who aren't like that. There's right. guys who struggle with suicide, with right. serious depression, and also I'm sure a lot of guys who just watch TV all day, like Daniel said. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, to keep it together in a place like that, you've got to be disciplined. You've got to have things to do, and you've got to have meaning. What, what type of programs do you take? So I'm in an extent, uh, extent, <laughs> existentialism group. I'm in a critical thinking group and a lot of church services. You know, I make it a point to keep as actively busy as possible. So if there's an opportunity to do something, I'm going to take advantage of it. What do you mean an existential group? <laughs> it's, uh, it's a group of about, there's about eight of us. It's just a group of guys finding meaning to still continue living on while on death row, knowing that we have the fate of death upon us. So it's an informal group? It's not a, a, a official program? You could call it that, yes. Can you talk about how you meet and, and discuss? Uh, that I cannot. Okay, got it. I have a question. Being up there, um, what gives your life meaning? What gives my life meaning? Yeah. I know the conditions aren't, you know, the best, but... It's noticing the little things along the way that yeah, I guess I'm more in tune to seeing now than I was prior to getting here. Well, can you give me an example of like what would be a good thing that would happen during the day? I mean, it could be something as small as walking outside and feeling the sun on my face. Mm. And that's just one small little example that, again, 
people walk through it each and every day without reflecting upon that one single instance that many just take for granted. And I guess now, because my life is so slowed down, I can focus on those, and it's those little things that make life beautiful. Do you think that your circumstances being on death row has has made you learn and know yourself better than most people have the opportunity to do? I, I, I absolutely, and I'll tell you why. It's because I have time to think. I have time to reflect. If you have children and if you have a job, if you're married, well, when you come home, you have to deal with the household. You have responsibilities of bills. You have jobs. You have a family. The demands on people in the outside world are different than the demands that I have because they don't have time because all of their time is filled up. Now, how will you leave a record of your life? Like, what would be left behind to say that Daniel was here and he mattered? I like to think that who I was prior to coming here, that man, you know, growing up, I made a lot of mistakes in my life. And... Um, that person, I guess, I've accepted as that guy being dead. Like, that's the guy that got the death penalty. That's the guy who's, you know, gotten lethal injection. Who I am now and who I wake up to to be each and every day, you know, who can I be remembered as if I can change two people's lives for the better where no one else could? That would give my life more meaning than I have any right to deserve. Do you think that opportunity exists where you are now to do that? Absolutely, without a doubt. you got a lot of lost souls that have nobody, and they're facing the impending doom of death. Um, are you a lost soul? Um, I was. I was. I'll put it that way. I was, but um, luckily enough, people have shaped me throughout the years I've been down and uh, continue shaping me to this day. I can only help, hope I return the favor. As long as you are alive, there is hope. When you are dead, that struggle is over. You can't look in terms of the future because the future is not yet here. So what do you have left? You have right now. And so that is what you have to live at right here, right now. That's eternity. When I have the inmates come to me and, and basically say, I'm going to kill myself, right? And, and um, there's just no point. You know, what's the point in me getting up another day and keep going, you know? And, and um, that happens a lot. It happens a lot. You know, people lose hope, I think. And, I, you know, I really, I think what they're really asking is, you know, help me find a way to keep going, right? Help me find some hope in, in this kind of dark and, and hopeless situation. I think the, the only way I can describe what it's like as a minister going in there, as a priest, is it's like going into this dark, dark cave with a flashlight. And and rem my, my work there is to remind the men in there that it's not all dark, that th despite where they are, that there's still light and that's, there's still God, there's still mercy, there's still purpose in life and that, they, um, that they're not beyond redemption. It's like the building itself and everything about it is meant to reinforce this oppressive darkness and hopelessness. And my job is to go in there with this little flashlight and remind them that there is hope. What do you think, E? Do you think you could keep it together up on the row? From my experience mm -hmm. of like 27 years in prison all together, I believe I can keep it together, yeah. It's like you adjust to it, like it's going to ASIC, going to the shoe, or going, you know, your program will change, and then after a while, you will get acclimated to whatever that program is. And mm -hmm. I, I would I would assume it's like having a, a disease or... Mm. 
cancer or something like that. You know it's there, but it's not something that you think about all the time. I would think. Right. You just have to learn to live with it right. because if you spend too much time in it. Dwelling in it and that's all your life is. You yeah. Know? And, you know, it's not just about the guys on death row. We didn't even get into how survivors or family members of the victims feel about death row and the guys up there. I'm sure they're going through a whole lot. Yeah, absolutely. There's so much more to learn. Yeah. So... If you're listening to this and you're on death row, send us a letter. And tell us more about your experiences on death row. See, we can't guarantee anything, but we'd sure love to hear from you. When we come back, it's count time. That's when we put in a little extra something. Today, we're going to go back to the main line and hear a familiar voice. Count time! Count time! I wanted to shine like magnesium, but my enthalpy was too low. So I tried to convert to helium, but my hydrogen was too slow. I weigh like 10 kilograms per mole. Blast! I need to drop a few pounds. But my structure is like a noble gas with no electrons to pass around. I wanted to change my name and symbol to fit in the periodic table. Potassium and tungsten giggled when iron said I wasn't able. Gold and silver and copper were on my side with mercury to lend a hand, but those metals don't react or collide. Results aren't in the plans. Sodium was salty. I dated chlorine. I was just trying to be nice. Iodine red on the scene. Conversion won't come out right. I want to balance my equation. Limited reagents cause precipitation instead of combustion. Now I hang with the sun, who is patient, showing light for my spectrum and state functions. One, two. That was Mesro performing his piece, Human Element. We want to thank everyone who was involved in this episode. Thanks to Kevin Sawyer for recounting his memory of the execution he was here for in 1999. And thanks to Father George Williams and Rabbi Paul Schleffer for sitting down with us in the Media Lab. And thanks to Steve Champion, Joseph Manuel Montez, and Daniel Wozniak for speaking to us from death row. And thanks to everyone who responded. And we're really sorry we couldn't speak with all of you. Ear Hustle is produced by myself, Erlon Woods, and Nigel Poor, with help from outside producer Pat Masidi Miller, who also works with the sound design team. This episode was scored with music by Antoine Williams, with contributions from David Jazzy. Curtis Fox is our story editor, and Julie Shapiro is our executive producer for Radiotopia. We also want to thank Warden Ron Davis, and as you know, every episode has to be approved by this guy here. I want to be a little more extensive with what with my words today uh, in that, you know, it's amazing to see uh, the response that Ear Hustle has uh, generated. It was originally designed for just really the listeners here at San Quentin, uh, uh, about 2,000 guys. Uh, today, um, there are millions of people who listen to it and it resonates with people. And so um, I'd like to say thank you. Thank you to all those people who uh, are taking the time and are listening episode by episode, and and that kind of leads me to a request I got not very long ago from one of my cousins. And so I'll give out a shot to her. I'm not going to say her name, uh, but she said, she said, Sam, she said, please, please, please. She said, the episodes are too short. She said, they got to be longer. <laughs> and so in that, I will close, and I will say my part, which is this is Lieutenant Sam Robinson at San Quentin State Prison, and I approve this story. You worked up there for a while, didn't you? All yeah, right. yeah. I, work, I worked on death row myself for 10 years. And Dave, how was that experience? Man, uh, I think it definitely shapes uh, uh, who I am today and how I engage with people inside this environment. Um, there are many days on there that were very, very difficult. Uh, and then there are more days that are more complex and 
um, much more different than your imagination could even even lead you to. I think our episode would be triple <laughs> the amount of time if I took the time to kind of just dive in and talk about what death row is like for a staff member. I think your cousin will appreciate that. Right on. <laughs> she appreciates the extra time. Ooh. Sounds like he's got a lot to say. Sounds like season three. Absolutely. Indeed. Check our website, earhustlesq.com, where you can sign up for our newsletter and download transcripts of our stories. Okay, E, I'm really glad that you brought up transcripts because I had this cool thing happen. What? Okay, a few weeks ago, I was giving a talk about Ear Hustle at the Starline Social Club in Oakland. Right. And this couple came up to me and told me that their son was incarcerated at Avenal State Prison. Mm. And they can't hear Ear Hustle there in Avenal, so the parents send him the transcripts of the show. And after he reads it, the transcripts get passed around the prison. Oh, that's what's up. Isn't that cool? That's, that, that is cool. So, hey, here's a shout out to all you guys out in Avenal for reading those transcripts and no. We're trying to get Ear Hustle into your prison. Actually, not just into Avenal. We'd love to get it into all of the prisons in the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. And actually, why all stop there? All over the country. All over the country. So if you're interested, if you have that power to get it into your institution, contact us through our website, earhustlesq.com. Next time on Ear Hustle. People love Lady J, and they asked for more. And this time, she's talking about what life is like for transgender people inside. Every day, <laughs> every day it's like I have to educate someone. Um, and it just might be a slip of the tongue, literally a slip of the tongue, calling me he instead of she. And then when you call me that, it's like, okay, hold up. Ear Hustle is a proud member of Radiotopia from PRX, a collection of the best podcasts around. Hear more at radiotopia.fm. I'm Erlon Woods. And I'm Nigel Poor. Thanks for listening. My favorite group from the 60s is without question The Temptations. My favorite group from the 70s is without question The Delphonics. My favorite uh, solo uh, singer is all the time is Aretha Franklin. So, you know, if I get the time, that's what I do in terms of just uh, relaxing and just listening and hear the music. Radio Tokyo. From PRX.